Now that you've learned the design basics, let's build one. Start working with adjustability right from the very beginning, in the check socket phase. Integrating adjustability in the check socket gives you an advantage. Your patient can actively test the fit and function right there in your office, allowing you to make simple and easy adjustments to the design before committing to the definitive socket. Making a RevoFit check socket is simple. Make your first check socket verifying fit and volume as always. If you nailed the fit on the first check socket, simply add RevoFit adjustability to it. If, however, changes are needed, fabricate a second check socket and then integrate RevoFit to this one. RevoFit adjustability works best on sockets that fit properly, and it's not meant to compensate for an ill-fitting socket, so make sure your check socket fits well before adding RevoFit. As a part of this educational course, Click provides a check socket kit with tools to make your first RevoFit check socket easy to build. In the kit, you'll find instructions, a dial base, a dial, lacing, the tubing that houses the lace, a wire lace feeder, and adhesive patterns for outlining the socket pads. You'll also want to have some sandpaper, superglue, 60 second composite adhesive, fiberglass casting tape, plastic wrap, and a Sharpie. One thing to keep in mind, the RevoFit system works best with a flexible insert. The insert helps distribute pressure evenly throughout the socket and prevents acute pressure around the movable panels. We recommend that you make the flexible insert in the check socket phase and use it for both the check socket and the definitive socket. Before we start, let's go back to the fundamental design questions. Where do I place the movable panels? Remember, the basic three-panel design we talked about in the last video positions pads on either side of the tibia and on the gastroc area. This design allows for adjustability in overall fit without transferring any pressure to the distal tibia. One way to think about it is to ask yourself, hmm, if this patient came back in three months complaining of pressure on the tibia or experiencing fit issues, where would I install padding? These are the places you will explore for panel placement. Panel positioning really begins by marking the bony protrusions on the flexible insert. These markings will show you the places to avoid when finding your panel placement. To help with panel design, we supply pre-shaped pad templates in the check socket kit. Adhere these to your padding material and then trim to size and skive the edges. Then, the panels are located one by one by taping a pad on the inner surface of the check socket in its likely location. Once a pad is positioned, have the patient weight bear in the socket. Work with them to refine the location, remembering that the pressure this pad creates will ultimately be adjustable. Once the patient is happy with the pad position, trace the location on the exterior of the socket with a Sharpie. Repeat this process to locate the other two pads. Where do I put the dial? Ultimately, dial placement is up to your patient's preference, and it really can go almost anywhere. But for this course, we will put the dial on the posterior panel along the top lacing pathway. Here, it's easy to access, even through clothing, and the gastroc area responds most efficiently to volume changes when adjusting. Before you mark the pathway that will connect the panels, you need to prep the socket. The RevoFit system will be held in place by wrapping the entire socket in fiberglass tape, so take a minute here to sand the socket and then reestablish your panel markings. Use the quarter rule to find the top quarter of the panel by dividing the panel in half with a ruler, then dividing the top half 
in half again. Draw a line across the panel at this point, and then draw your dial location in the center of this line. How do I make it connect? To connect the panels and the dial, you will use the tubing that comes in your check socket kit. Again, as we discussed in our socket design course, there are a few rules to follow to ensure efficient adjusting. The lacing pathways must run parallel across the panels, perpendicular to the edges of the panels, extend one centimeter beyond the panel edges before turning, and follow gentle turns to avoid kinking the tubing. Start your pathway by identifying where the tubing will cross each of the panels. Again, use the quarter rule. Take your Sharpie and a ruler and mark the center of the panel. Then divide each half section of the panel in half again to create four evenly spaced sections. And draw a line across the top quarter and the bottom quarter of the panel. Extend the lines one centimeter beyond each panel edge. Repeat this process for the other two panels. Use the quarter rule every time you map tubing lines across any panel. This ensures even compression when the panel adjusts. Now let's mark the entire lacing pathway with your Sharpie. With a dial in the center of the top line on the posterior panel, start from one insertion point and route to an adjacent panel so that it connects to the top line. If you have to make a turn on the frame, go ahead, but make it gentle and rounded, not angled. Extending your pathway one centimeter beyond the panel's edge, make a gentle turnaround on the frame and route back through the bottom quarter of the panel, through the posterior panel, and onto the next panel. Again, you will draw a gentle turnaround on the frame so the pathway can return along the top of the panel and to the other insertion point on the dial. In some cases, there will not be enough room to have two turnarounds in the same area on the frame. In this case, route the lacing in a way that makes the most sense, but follows design rules. All turns on the frame should round gently to ensure the lace tubing will not kink. We like to use a round object as a guide when we actually connect the tubing, but we'll show you that later on. So you've got your sanded socket, you've got your panels located, and your tubing lines drawn. So let's build it. Start by mounting the dial base. Notice that the base has two exit ports that are 180 degrees from each other. These ports will align with the lacing pathway you have drawn across the panel. Remove the sticker liner from the dial base and place it on the socket. Next, lay down the tubing along the marked pathway. To do this, trim one end of the tube to a 45 degree angle and insert it into the center of the dial base. From there, guide the tubing along the pathway securing it at every inch with a dot of superglue. Remember, this is a no-kink zone. When you have to make a turn on the frame, use a round object, like a dowel, to gently guide the turn and glue the tubing in place. It's important to note that if the tubing gets kinked, it cannot be used. The lacing will only work properly with one continuous length of tubing, so if you end up with a kink, you'll have to remove the tubing from the socket, trim the kink, and start again with a kink-free length of tubing. Do not try to glue two pieces of tubing together on the socket. As you approach the reinsertion point, stop gluing about 10 centimeters from the dial base. Measure out the tubing, cut it, and insert it fully into the base. Then, go back and secure this section with superglue. Finally, Secure the tubing permanently to the socket using a bead of 60-second adhesive on both sides of the tubing. If you've marked your pathway correctly, your tubing will run parallel across all panels and have two turnaround curves on the frame. If your panels are at different levels, there will be gentle turns on the frame 
so that the tubing crosses the panels parallel to the other tube pathway and perpendicular to the panel edges. Wrapping the socket. Now, wrap the whole thing, socket, tubing, and dial base, in two layers of fiberglass casting tape. Then, to make sure the fiberglass fully bonds, tightly wrap the whole thing in clear plastic wrap. Once the fiberglass has set, about two minutes, remove the plastic and remark your panel locations on the socket. Next, cut out the panels using a segmented cast saw blade. This takes practice, so work carefully and use the small end of the blade on the small radius turns. Once the panels are cut out, smooth the panel and socket edges with a grinder. Then clear any particles stuck in the tubing. Next, grind or cut away the fiberglass covering the dial base to expose the protective sticker. Remove the sticker to expose the interior of the dial base. Next, glue the pads to the panel and use a grinder to smooth and skive each edge so the pads have a convex surface. It's typical to use a 6mm density foam with a shore of around 35. Now, thread the lace. Using the wire lacing tool, Start from the inside of the dial base and thread the lace through one side of the tubing. At each panel, exit the frame, then enter the corresponding tube crossing the panel. Then enter the frame again. Continue until you've laced each panel and threaded the lace back into the dial base. Next, attach the lace to the dial. Cut the lace to length with the lace ends extending about 15 centimeters or 7 inches beyond the dial base on both sides. Then use the wire lacing tool to thread the lace into one of the small holes on the dial and out of the corresponding large hole on the other side. Tie a double overhand knot trim burn the end and pull the knot into the dial. Repeat for the other lace end. The final step is to insert the dial into the dial base. To do this, remove the slack from the lace by pulling one of the panels completely out to pull the dial against the dial base. Then insert the feet of the dial into the slots in the dial base and turn it a quarter turn clockwise to lock it into place. Cycle the system several times by pulling up on the dial to release the lace tension and pull one of the panels out. Re-engage the dial by pushing down and twist to tighten, ensuring that the lace is not caught anywhere in the system. If it is, remove the dial by squeezing the dial base with pliers to put pressure on the release tab and turn it counterclockwise. Then clear the problem and reinsert the dial. Cycle the system again. That's it. Your socket is complete. By designing and testing adjustability on the check socket, you can be sure the definitive will be awesome. So when the whole family, including grandma, comes to your office to see your patient take his first steps, you can be totally confident it'll fit. Adjustability really is life-changing. For your patients, it means the freedom to get out and live their lives to the fullest, whether that's climbing a mountain or simply being comfortable at a long day of work. 
For you, adjustability means you are building sockets that fit today, tomorrow, and every day. So, instead of trying to make a rigid socket fit a limb that has changed, you can move on to better things, like seeing new patients, or sneaking out of the office for a round of golf.